I'm up in Maine with the workbench that I built here about seven or eight years ago. This workbench was actually the cornerstone of a semester in the hand tool school that I call orientation. The idea of starting, you know, in a space with absolutely nothing, using some construction lumber, some easy, readily available lumber to build a bench, several different uh, workbench appliances, and really get you started in woodworking. One of the key things about this, we'll just call it a Nicholson English style bench that has become really popular recently is it has no vices no vices at all. It's got some ingenious work holding on it. And there's nothing wrong with woodworking vices. I've got two of them on my bench at home, although I really only use one. Woodworking vices are quick and efficient, but I think you'll find also working without a vice can teach you some really important technique lessons. And you might actually be surprised that you end up preferring to work without a vice for certain operations. I'm not going to tell you to take the vices off your bench or swear off vices altogether, but I can tell you there is a lot of really good technique to be gained by working without a vice. At its core, working without vices at your workbench means understanding the direction of force. So as I make a plane pass, as I chop with a chisel or pair with a chisel or saw a dovetail or a tenon, the saw is exerting a force on the board. If I'm sawing a dovetail, the saw is exerting a force straight into the bench. If I'm sawing a tenon, it's working along the edge of the bench. And the work holding needs to work in opposition to that direction of force. So every task that you make, understanding that direction of force and how to resist it passively or maybe actively. Now passively, I mean with something like a dog. So when I put a dog under the bench and I run up a board up against it and I plane right down the center of that board, the board doesn't move because the plane is moving directly into the dog, the direction of force. If I move my plane to the outboard, just to the outboard side of the bench, I might get a little bit of movement because I'm working to the edge of the board. Now this board isn't really wide enough to do that. If I continue to move out of here to the edge, you can see the board rotates a little bit because the pressure is not directly into the dog. This is where having a planing stop, just a wider board, can essentially cradle the entire edge. And as I plane laterally across the board, I've got full support and the board's not going to move around on me. But the key thing is, is there's absolutely nothing restraining this board. And I find one of the biggest mistakes that comes with planing is just kind of standing here, planing away and not really checking your progress or seeing where am I removing stock. Being able to take a plane pass, pick it up, examine your lines, say I've, I've already got one face flat and I'm bringing the second face parallel down to some marking lines. Well, you need to be able to pick it up and look at those lines and see how close am I and I need to remove a little bit more material on this side, kind of check the board again and literally spot plane down your lines. And the ability to just pick it up and move it around is so important there. The other thing is when the plane or your technique changes slightly and maybe I have too much pressure out here on the knob, well, what happens is the back of the board jumps. As I come to the end of the board, it's very subtle here, but the board is, is jumping. But what that tells me is I'm putting too much pressure on the toe of the plane as I exit the board. And essentially I'm tapering this board. How many of you plane away and plane away and you pick up your board and you look and you realize this far end is actually thinner than the end you started on? Proper planing technique means you've got Good pressure on the toe as the plane gets fully on the board you've got even pressure between the tote and the toe and as you exit the board there's no pressure a lot of times you can take your hand off the knob and all the pressure is on the tote well with the pressure on the tote as the board exits you can't really have this heel jumping up because you've got pressure right down here holding that all the way off the edge of the board and leaving it not clamped, leaving it free really will let you see when your plane technique starts to suffer. Another thing is if the topography of the board is a little bit wonky 
and it's wobbling around on the bench. Leaving this board unclamped will let it move on you and you'll be able to see where your high spots are. And I can flip the board over and I can say, okay, it was wiggling here. Let's hit just that spot and prevent it from wiggling now. Mostly, it's just the ability to keep picking up the board and checking your progress and not having to unclamp a vise. With like tail vices or end vices where you're running up against a dog and there's the vise coming in and, and pressing it here, you actually can exert a substantial amount of force that will slightly bow the board and you're planing, planing it flat and you release the tension, the board actually goes out of flat because you had it under compression. So you have to be careful with that. Certainly you can back the, the, the compression off the vise, the rotate the vise backwards a little bit, but then you have to ask yourself, why do I need that holding it, restraining it in place, when all I have to do is resist the direction of force? Now there will be times when you need to plane across the board, and you could pop up a dog and go against the direction of force, but if you're going diagonally, that's kind of hard to do. So you essentially use two stops. I've got my stop down here, resisting the direction of force this way, this bench, I have a planing beam that I can slide up. And now I just slide the board into that inside corner and I can work diagonally across the board. I can work longitudinally. I can also traverse and go directly across the board because I'm resisting the direction of force in really three directions at once. Uh, if you don't have a planing beam like this, then you know that's where something like just taking a, a batten and hold fasting that batten in place. And now I've got the same type of, of action because um, you may not have that kind of center planing beam to work against. For edge planing, you can run it up against a stop and essentially you're balancing this. But for jointing, I tend to hook one finger behind the tote and kind of trail these fingers on the side. It's almost like training wheels. And when the board isn't clamped in place, you can very easily feel if the board kind of wants to jigger one way or the left, one way or the other, you are putting uneven pressure on the board and that's going to result in and out of square face. So just keeping it upright, keeping the balance right, and keeping the direction of force into the planing stop will actually result in squarer edges. The taller the board, the more difficult it can be to, to, to balance it. So a lot of times what I'll do is just work right on the edge of the apron. And because I've got this big white apron, there's lots of support there. I have a peg right here in the bench. I'm not really a big fan of crochets. Crochets are nice. They're essentially hooks that come out at an angle that not only uh, resist the board passively, but also kind of push it in because it's wedged in place. I kind of prefer to just have the single peg and then I take another peg and drop it right here. And again, the passive stop, the board isn't being clamped and, and held in place. It's just resting there. And a lot of times, I can then take a hold fast back here and whack that in place. And now I've got full support to edge plane. And because I've got you know a wide apron, I can take wider and wider boards and continue to support them all the way down here. You can put a 10, 11, 12 inch wide board and do edge planing there. And even things like groove or rabbit joinery, I find is still easier to work without a vise. I can put a dog here in the bench top, run my piece right up against it, and then grab a hold fast on the back side, lock that into place. I've got the edge of my board flush with the front of the apron, which certainly if you've got a fence plane, the, the fence needs room as you sink the apron or a lot of times it'll just bottom out of the bench top. Moreover, this wide surface here acts as kind of a visual guide. It can be really beneficial to keeping the whole thing nice and square. Sometimes this hold fast in the back end can get in the way. You've got like fence rods or something like that. And this is where, again, using something like a full length batten 
pressing that in place, using hold fast to secure that in place. And I put another hold fast down here, and now the board is perfectly free. And this is actually my preferred method because again, as I'm planing along here, I'm usually working to a line. It can be very difficult to see my line with my current perspective. So just being able to pick up the board and look at it and see, okay, I need to remove a little bit more here. I'm almost at my line here. Then I come back, take a pass right there, take a full length pass. You know, being able to constantly pick it up and check it is gonna end up with a more accurate rabbit. And this idea of having a batten and a single dog resisting the direction of force in both ways, the fence in and the, the plane coming into the dog, means that the board is loose to jump around if your technique goes awry, but more importantly, just being able to check it constantly to ensure accuracy. And when you step away from face planing, you start to think, oh, I'm really gonna need some vices. And certainly, when I move into things like sawing tenons or resawing, I use my leg vise a lot at home. But working on this bench, I actually discovered the benefit, again, of working against a passive stop and just how powerful that can be. Here I've got the same peg that I was edge planing into. I put another peg down here in the apron and essentially wedged them between them. And then the hold fast is just holding it up against the bench. So the direction of force as I'm sawing a tenon is against this peg. Well, of course, if you were to push down there, the board would want to swing out at the bottom. So it's essentially trapped between these two pegs. The hold fast is just kind of fighting gravity at this point. And working against that passive stop basically puts the entire mass of the bench behind my quote vice and it really reduces any vibration because I'm working straight into that. I don't have something pressing that could possibly slip. And I know with some cheaper face vices, as you're sawing up here in the top, that kind of torquing motion, that rotary motion that the saw creates can really cause the, the vise to fail and cause the board to actually shift. And you see somebody sawing with a tenon, and the tenon keeps getting lower and lower and lower as they saw. But with this method, the board does not shift at all. And if you can listen to the saw, you can see I've got no extraneous vibration coming from the board, no rattle coming from the board because it's solidly anchored against the bench because I'm working with a passive stop. Now, if you bind the saw at all, and I just did for a second, you saw the board kind of shift back like that. There again is having the board somewhat free here, not restrained in the vise, will telegraph any poor um, body alignment. I twisted my hips out a little bit and it caused the saw to come out at an angle, which caused it to bind. If I'm properly aligned, and the saw's running true, you're not gonna get any shifting. You can just kind of, I just kind of rest my hand here and you can feel if the board wants to move. Now certainly, adjusting a vise is going to be a lot faster, but that is all it takes and I'm on to the other side and can continue my cut. Now this peg and hold fast setup is actually the setup that I use for resawing a lot in my shop at home. See, if I was resawing a board like this, it would be fine in any leg vise or even a face vise. As you move into a wider and wider board, there's more teeth engaged. If you're resawing a you know, 15 inch wide board or a 20 inch wide board, that's a heck of a lot of force. And my 48 inch frame saw will eat through that wood, but there's still a heck of a lot of teeth engaged. And I've actually shifted my Rubo workbench. It's close to a 500 pound workbench. I've actually shifted that bench from time to time because of the force of all those teeth engaged. No vice is going to hold that well, and that's where you have to use something like a passive stop. And the beauty of this viceless setup is, you know, I have this peg here, I could move this peg out here or down here or down here and really take really, really wide boards. I could even have multiple peg attachments, multiple holdfast attachments across this wide apron. And the viceless setup there is one that you just can't anticipate with a, with a vice, with a leg vice. You're gonna have struggle to find a vice with a wide enough capacity and the holding power to hold a board that wide. So yeah, it's a bit of an outlier situation, but frankly, really wide boards is why I got into resawing by hand in the first place because there was no bandsaw with the capacity to handle it. Well, not one for less than $25,000 anyway.
Now, if I remove on the dovetailing, again, as I said, I'm not suggesting you live entirely without vices, but if you're working on a bench like this and you're thinking, well, how do I do kind of straight on sawing? So the same thing can apply, but a lot of times what I'll do is rest the board on a peg and then I can use a hold fast to clamp it to the bench or sometimes I can replace this peg with the hold fast itself and with one device hold it in place. With dovetailing, it's easy because the direction of force is right into the bench. And again, because the passive stop in this instance is the entire bench. You've got that huge mass of the bench holding things in place and you can saw your dovetails. Again, a quiet saw stroke because I've got no vibration. The board's not moving at all. And frankly, if you have some walkie saw technique binding the saw, the board is free to shift from left to right. So just like with the planing, I'm working right in the direction of force. And if I alter that, it becomes very obvious very quickly. The rest of the time when I'm working on the bench top, I'm relying upon a bench hook. Bench hooks for the win every single time, whether I'm using something like a simple narrow Sloyd hook like this, or some of the wider platform pairing hooks that I use in my shop at home. It's really the way to go for all the same reasons I just talked about. Working against the direction of force, keeping that board free to telegraph any changes in the technique, any you know misalignments in your technique. It's just super fast. If I wanted to saw a dado in this board, I've got two bench hooks here. If I had one bench hook, it'd be the same thing. Just push it right up against the fence and the direction of force again is straight against it. I've got my body weight pushing into the fence. I can guide my saw across my knife lines. But one of the other things in cutting a dado is you've got a certain depth line you want to see to. And sometimes it's just hard to see. So you can quickly pick it up, check both sides of the cut. Check that far side until you get right to your line and you're good to go. And the fact that I haven't restrained the board or clamped it in place or anything like that means that I can very quickly cut right to my lines. And again, if I misaligned at all, the board is going to want to walk from side to side. It's going to want to jump. The saw is going to bind in the cut, which is going to cause the board to jump, which is a key safety tip. If this is clamped in place and the saw binds because of a body misalignment, there's a stronger chance that I will kink the saw plate. But if the board is free and it binds, the board's going to jump and it's not going to kink the saw plate. Well, there's a much less chance of it kinking the saw plate. Now, say I wanted to move into a situation where I needed my other hand. I needed a free hand. Um, say I'm going to chisel this out. I can bring a hold fast to bear and I can clamp it down so that it's nice and secure. Now I can come back here with a chisel and chop out the waist. And I've got both hands to work the chisel and the mallet, but it's also just as fast to free it, flip the board around, and for that matter, shift my entire operation you know, to be in line with my bench hooks or away from a hold fast or near a hold fast, flip it around and finish my cut. Likewise, uh, an operation that I do a lot that is two handed is finishing up a, um, what's this thing called? <laughs> a dado with a router plane. So now, I can bring my router plane to bear very easily. Finish this up. Now, this could be a situation where my hold fast is a little bit in the way. Now the hold fast is down here, completely out of the way. And I can use my router plane finish off the dado using both hands. Or say for some reason I needed a hole right here. I'm just going to drill through my dado. 
I've got it restrained so I can use, again, both hands to make the cut. What I really like about this particular setup is it's suspended off the bench so I can run a finger underneath and feel for that point sticking through. So then, free it, flip it over, re-secure it, and I can finish off the hole from the other side. You spend a lot of time working like this, thinking about that whole direction of force thing. So I saw this tendon cheek earlier. If I wanted to saw off the, the, um, the cheek itself, I've got a knife line here. You could work across the grain and that knife line, again, right into the, the bench hooks to create that knife wall. Um, a lot of times what I like to do is embrace that direction of force idea. And let's just take a peg, stick it in a hole in the back, and now I can work directly into that peg. Let's clear the gunk out of the way first. And now I've got a little bit more controlled method for creating that knife wall just by working straight into a peg. I bring my bench hooks back to bear. Grab my saw. And finish off that cheek cut. Here again, the ability to have this piece free and to work it by flipping it around, it just makes it easier. So I can, just using body weight, press up against these and I can pair my cheek. I can see my saw cuts here, it's a little bit uneven there. Or say I'd already had the mortise cut and I needed to thin it out. Well, one of the things you can get in trouble, if this was clamped into place and I thin it out, or maybe I'm using something like a rabbiting block plane here, or shoot, even my, my router plane. You work one face and then you end up with the tenon slightly off center. This, since I don't have to go through any effort of unclamping, it's just a matter of flipping it and working the other side. And you're gonna have a tendency to get a more evenly centered tenon just by being able to flip it back and forth. Anytime we have to stop and free a hold fast or unscrew a vise, you think, well, I'll just make one more pass here. And you try to get it all done on one side before you flip it over. And here again, constantly being able to look at your lines, having the board free to check it, means it's just gonna end up being more accurate in the long run. So in the end, like I said at the beginning, there's no reason to swear off vices altogether. A vice can be more efficient. As I showed, I can dovetail or tenon with just a series of holdfasts and a peg over on the side of my bench, but my leg vise is just super efficient. The ability to just clamp the work, saw, unclamp, and go back to work. Moreover, a lot of times we can be better served and more accurate in our joinery if we unclamp and kind of check our sawing or maybe adjust mid-saw cut if things start to go awry. That can be a little bit more difficult with holdfasts and pegs and maybe force us to maybe just kind of power through the cut when adjusting it would make the cut go a little bit easier. So a vise can certainly be really efficient. I mean, let's face it, vices are cool. They're like workbench jewelry and we love to have them and play with them and spin the wheel and watch them turn. But there are some areas, and I hope this video has shown you, where the vice just gets in the way and embracing viceless work holding is going to be not only more efficient, but more precise in the work that you do. But if you take nothing else away from this video, surface planing using nothing but a stop, leaving the board free and letting the movement of the board kind of talk to you about where you need to apply pressure to the plane, where the high spots of the board are, listen to and pay attention to that board. Clamping it down doesn't let you see any of that and you can learn so much more and more importantly, plane a board a lot faster by paying attention to how it jumps around or doesn't jump around on the bench top. And if you haven't seen it yet, check out my video on spot planing here on this channel. Really, this has been a revolutionary change in my technique. It's allowed me to mill boards faster. It's allowed me to mill boards really in seconds sometimes. And it doesn't require a vise, it just requires a planing stop. 
And it certainly dovetails nicely into the idea of a viceless workbench.